with Republicans, in their words, pressing pause on these talks with the White House that have, listen, the global economy hanging in the balance. President Biden's projecting confidence from 7,000 miles away as he's cutting deals to send fighter jets to Ukraine. We'll take you live to D.C. and to Japan with the latest. Also tonight, new pressure on the FBI with new court documents showing agents broke the rules, looking up people during the George Floyd protests and the January 6th attack. What else these docs are telling us? And breaking in just the last hour, the death of an NFL legend. More on the life and legacy of Jim Brown. Plus, new raids by China cracking down on U.S. firms doing business in that country. We'll take you live to Beijing, where CEOs say they're afraid to bring their business over there. Then, in tonight's original, a star pitcher opens up about his struggles with anxiety. Why he says a few weeks on the injured list are helping him get his head back in the game. And with Taylor Swift heading up to Boston for the weekend, her Eras tour is nearly halfway done with time running out to get tickets. And for some people, their money's running out too. The runaway cost of shows these days and how to curb it a little later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And soon, President Biden and the other leaders of the G7 are going to hear a new plea for help directly from the Ukrainian president. As we're learning tonight about a new agreement to give high-powered fighter jets to help in the war with Russia. But as President Biden is cutting deals on foreign policy issues, there are some key talks happening here at home to try to prevent basically a global economic catastrophe. Those are hitting a roadblock. Right now, the lead negotiator for Republicans, Congressman Garrett Graves, you see him here walking out of the Capitol, not sounding like super duper pleased with how talks are going to make sure that the U.S. can pay its bills on time. Listen. Pressing pause. It's not a rewind. It's not a fast forward. It's not a play. It's a pause, right? So what's the vibe from the White House side? A spokesperson tells our team, look, there is a path forward, but it is a difficult path. They're projecting kind of a longer term calm with short term frustration because of where both sides are here. No differences, however, among America's allies when it comes to helping Ukraine. We talked about this dual split screen, right? The foreign policy deal making, the domestic deal making. On the foreign policy side, a senior administration official is telling our team's allies will give them F 16s at some point. And what we're hearing on that, not many details. No agreement on when these planes will get there, how many Ukraine will get, if they're even going to come directly from the U.S. Unlikely, but the source says Ukraine's got to use it for defense, not for any counteroffensive plans. It's part of a bigger push to try to train Ukrainian pilots that the president's endorsing. Julie Serka is on Capitol Hill with the view on how talks are going at home in just a sec. But I want to start overseas with Mike Memoli, who is live for us, of course, from where all, this is all happening in Japan. Um, let me start with sort of the foreign policy deal making here. Big story is the fighter jets. Um, for months, there was sort of a question mark here on the president not committing to a plan involving F 16s. That is changing now. Talk us through it. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. On Friday, it was all about the expected and the less expected, as we'll put it, as it relates to new actions by the G7 alliance on Ukraine. We'll start with the expected, announcing a set of sanctions on Russia. Uh, as part of this deal, there's going to be a ramped up enforcement of the existing sanctions. There's been efforts by third parties to help Russia evade those sanctions that have been piling up for the better part of the last 15 months. The second set is really new ramped up efforts to cut off Russia's efforts to replenish its war machine, as it's being put in the G7 summit. So that was part of the big announcement in the statement of unity by the G7 allies that we were sort of tracking all along. Less expected was the announcement, really the, the revelation President Biden gave the green light to our allies to move ahead with a plan to train those Ukrainian pilots on F-16 similar uh, styles of fighter jets from other European allies. And this, I think, speaks to a number of things. We've seen this throughout the 15 months of this Ukraine war, which is the U.S. saying they're not on board with something and then slowly but surely moving their way towards green lighting it. And this speaks to really, I think, in part, the power of personality by President Zelensky. He's been on something of a whirlwind tour, multiple capitals he's visited in Europe over the course of the last week. He was in Saudi Arabia today speaking to the Arab League, where he again made a plea uh, for the support, not just from the West, but from other key stakeholders as well. Let's listen to part of his message. We do have truth on our side. Moreover, we are pushing the occupiers out of our land. 
So this is going to be a big moment on Sunday when Zelensky comes here to Hiroshima, where he's going to speak not just to the G7 leaders, but other invited countries, including India, Indonesia, other countries that maybe haven't been part of the sort of alliance in support of Ukraine so far. But you also laid out, Hallie, some important caveats to what President Biden gave the green light to. It's going to be some some months, potentially 18 months, according what to the one top Pentagon official, to train these Ukrainian pilots on the use of these F-16s. We don't know which countries yet are going to supply them. We don't know how many are going to come along. So even if you cut that 18 months in half, you're still talking about next February before they get these fighter jets. And at that point, we're talking about two years into the invasion. Right. So a long way to get from here to there. Uh, but it's a significant development none nonetheless. What, one of the things you're doing here, we're going to get to Julie Serkin on the Hill in a second, is you are juggling this foreign policy ball with the balls of domestic policy, right, as President Biden is juggling all of those things as well. Um, talk us through where things are going on that front, because we always say the president is the president no matter where they travel. That's kind of a trope for White Houses, meaning he and his team are still staying engaged in these negotiations here. The picture, uh, the, the White House put out a picture to make that point, that he is still engaged in these, mm -hmm. quote-unquote, debt ceiling talks, basically making sure the U.S. pays the bill it needs to on time. The vibe check from the Hill side seems to be not great. What about the vibe check from the White House side? Well, we had a bit of whiplash here, as you know, Hallie, because yep. we started out our Friday here in Hiroshima thinking that things were on a good track, that the White House was signaling potentially that uh, President Biden could speak to Speaker McCarthy on Sunday before he had ho heads home to maybe lay the groundwork for those final negotiations. And then within a matter of hours, those White House negotiators were leaving Capitol Hill in a hurry and Republicans saying they didn't want to be talking to themselves anymore. So what could possibly have happened? Well, we're seeing really the flanks in both parties starting to agitate increasingly publicly about what it might be ne being negotiated here. And that's really potentially a, a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at the way these negotiations typically play out. But, Hallie, I think you also have to really consider the reality of intercontinental negotiating, because that pause moment this morning came really as President Biden was calling it quits for the day. We're now at the early hours of Saturday morning here in Hiroshima, so right. the president is probably going to be getting read in very soon on just what happened. So that gap in time between when talks break down and then when the key principal on this side can engage and try to fix things is pretty wide. And I think it speaks to why he had to cut this trip short to get home quickly. He will be getting home. Uh, we know after the weekend, Mike Memoli, thank you. Let me get to Julie Serkin, as promised, on Capitol Hill. The argument here from Congressman Graves, who's running point on this for House Republicans, uh, is that, you know, listen, the House passed a strong bill. Like, that's that, and that's what people should do. Let me, let me play a little bit more of what he said. Some people are willing to have reasonable conversations about how you can actually move forward and do the right thing, then we're not going to sit here and talk to ourselves. We heard what seemed like at least some level of confidence from Speaker Kevin McCarthy, although I don't want to overstate that either. I also don't want to overstate this isn't death for the debt ceiling, right? Like, we are not in, like, fatal blows territory just yet. Not in fatal blows territory just yet, but we have a week and a half until the June 1st deadline. And I got to tell you, just in the last few minutes, we were actually told Speaker McCarthy left the building. And I was outside of it uh, for the last couple of hours. We saw his top allies, including Graves, that you just saw on the screen, go back and forth, shuttling from his office. And the bottom line here is when Graves came out of that meeting this morning, which was not very long, and the White House had left a few minutes before, that was really the first time he's talked to the press openly all week since, he, he, since he's been put in this position, and many Democrats I spoke to were actually pretty surprised of that development, of him saying, let's just hit a pause on this. So here's some of what we've been reporting, right? All of this boils down to the fact that Democrats, at least publicly with President Biden leading them, they want to make sure that these two things, the spending cuts and the debt uh, ceiling lift, are moving separately. That's what they've been saying all along. But it sounds like McCarthy is in a position to try and squeeze them and move those things together. One of the ideas they have is, for example, to pair a budget deal with a debt ceiling lift into 2025. We don't know what the status of that now, but right now, all of these different sides are, are fighting over the fact of caps limits. Take a listen to what Speaker McCarthy has to say, and we'll talk about why that's such a big deal on the other side. Yesterday, I really felt we were at the location where I could see the path. The, the White House is just, look, we can't be spending more money next year. We have to spend less than we spent the year before. It's pretty easy. It's pretty simple, but it's not, because spending less money at the 2022 levels, for example, would undo much of what Democrats did in their Inflation Reduction Act, much of what President Biden is running on again, and they all know that. 
Julie Sirkin, live for us there on Capitol Hill. Julie, thank you. Uh, I know you will keep us posted with these developments that seem to come every minute. Appreciate it. So listen, a court order released just before we came on the air says the FBI did something it shouldn't have done, that it misused information from this big database against crime victims and January 6th riot suspects and people connected to Black Lives Matter protests. According to these documents, the FBI wrongly looked up info in this digital system for information about Americans and others more than 278,000 times in 2020 and early 2021, including people arrested at demonstrations over the killing of George Floyd, and these searches continued for months after the insurrection at the Capitol. Now listen, there is never a great time for an acknowledgement like this, but right now it is an especially not great time for the FBI, with some Republicans in Congress calling for budget cuts to the agency. And at the same time, the FBI is trying to get a law passed that would extend the very authorization they allegedly abused in this case. Let's get to Ken Delaney for more on this. Okay, Ken, so talk us through targets here, the info the oh. FBI may have gotten in this sort of very extraordinary story. Yeah, Hallie, this is a terrible story, but it's also not as terrible as some of the critics on the far right and the far left are making it out to be. Let me explain. We all remember, or maybe some don't, but in, back in the 1970s, the FBI was essentially a lawless organization when it came to domestic spying. They did horrible things. They bugged Martin Luther King's bedroom. They mm. spied on anti-war opponents and, and a variety of dissidents around the United States. That led to a series of congressional hearings. It was a massive scandal. It led to this law called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. So now there are a lot of rules around things that the FBI can do when it comes to domestic surveillance. So what happened here is there is a huge database of information gathered for foreign intelligence purposes by the National Security Agency. It's foreigners talking to foreigners abroad. But sometimes they talk to Americans. Sometimes they talk about Americans. And so there is some American information in there. And sometimes the FBI queries that database when it has a good legal reason to do so with the names of Americans to see if there are any ties to foreigners in a particular investigation. Well, what happened here is the FBI did that inappropriately on a mass scale in some instances that are very disturbing, frankly. They did it with a lot of January 6 protesters. They did it, according to this document, with 19,000 people who donated to a political campaign because they thought that campaign was subject to foreign influence. And they did it with some Black Lives Matter protesters or people connected to that protest. It's not entirely clear. The FBI says it was essentially a mistake that it, in many cases, information wasn't even accessed from these queries. Again, it's not spying, right? It's, it's querying a name in a database that may or may not come up with information, probably in most cases did not. But nonetheless, it's an abuse of power, and people uh, both on the left, Jerry Nadler, the Democrat mm -hmm. uh, in charge of the uh, ranking Democrat on the House Judiciary Committee, and on the far right, which is very skeptical of the FBI, are, are raising a ruckus here. And it's going to be a big problem, because the FBI, the very law that is at issue here, Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is expiring at the end of this year. And it, the FBI and other agencies are trying to get it renewed. And by the way, it's the biggest source of intelligence in the United States. It makes up like 75 percent of the presidential daily brief, and it's in peril right now. And now members of Congress are saying, we are not renewing this thing until you guys clean up your act. I mean, listen, Ken, like I hear you when you say, hey, it, you know, it's not the 70s. They're not bugging civil rights leaders bedrooms. Right. But like there is, I think, a level of expectation that Americans have about what their law enforcement agencies are going to do. There is a trust and confidence question mark here. Right. Does the FBI acknowledge that? Oh, 100 percent. They know that this is a terrible story for them. What they say is, look, the reason you know about this is because we did an audit and we made mm. the results of that audit public through the courts and we have changed the rules on this. Uh, but, you know, the problem with that is they've been saying that for years. They've been saying, trust us, trust us. The FISA process is, is has integrity and they keep getting caught doing the wrong thing. So there is a trust issue here. But just to emphasize, like this is not people getting the contents of your email, right? That's not what this is. This is running names against the data database that may or may not have some information if you were talking to foreigners. So that's why I say it's much different from bugging somebody's hotel room, Allie. Ken Delanian, uh, thank you for the context. Thank you for all of that. Appreciate it, Ken. You bet. Just before we come on the air, a judge is deciding a Massachusetts Air National Guardsman accused of leaking top secret Pentagon documents online will have to wait in jail until his trial starts instead of getting released to his dad's home like his lawyers had asked for. Our reporter inside court tells us the judge sided with prosecutors because Jack Teixeira, who you see here, he says had been trusted with top secret stuff and knew that what he was doing could hurt the U.S. He referenced some evidence that the government's lawyers filed earlier this week, 
where they said that Teixeira's bosses caught him taking notes on top secret documents and doing deep dives on information that wasn't relevant to his job. He got in trouble, but he kept his job and he kept his access to classified information. Teixeira hasn't entered a plea yet for the charges he, he's facing in a case that's sparking, as you know, national concerns over how well this country is actually able to protect classified in info. Andrea Mitchell is joining us now. So, Andrea, bring us up to speed here, because the judge basically said the evidence the government brought was strong. He said, when you look at who Teixeira put at risk, you could make a list as long as a phone book about it. That played into this decision, it seems. Yeah, he said the list as long as the phone book could include military personnel, overseas medical personnel, me medical volunteers and other personnel, Ukrainian citizens. I mean, he, he denounced his conduct. It's one of the strongest hearings, uh, statements by a judge that I have ever heard, yeah. uh, at least as conveyed by Adam Reese, our reporter you referenced, who's in the courtroom. And he just went, you know, he said the government has... He made a very strong case. He rejected the argument that he could be released on bail, saying that foreign governments could gain access to secrets. And frankly, the, the judge didn't specifically say this, but we know from the government's case that they have no idea yet how many secrets he may have exposed. And the government uh, did point out that, you know, there were more than 150 people in his chat room and that eventually a lot of that got online beyond those uh, very, you know, limited chat rooms into the public domain and that there were foreign people that he knew were registered in that chat room uh, that the judge said he showed that his defiance and his complete disregard for any of the warnings that he had received and that had training into the importance of his the national secrets and what the judge didn't say here and what uh, many of us and certainly the people in the national security field mm -hmm. are very concerned about is that the, there were two supervisors from the Pentagon were suspended. They've eliminated that unit. They've taken that unit's work from Massachusetts and put it on another base. That said, uh, this says volumes about really the failures of military background checks. He retained his top secrets clearance even after he had been uh, several times reprimanded, as you pointed out, for abusing that, that privilege. Um, you, you are right, I think, Andrea, as you know, to, to character. I mean, it is a, a very strong statement from a judge here in a case like this. There is the opportunity for an appeal, though, right? I'm, I'm not sure I, I heard you, Hallie. If you were asking whether he can appeal, yes, he can yes. appeal. But Got considering it. what this judge, who still has jurisdiction, said today, I think it's very unlikely he is going to get out at any time uh, before a trial. And given also the posture of this judge, you could imagine that there would be some sort of a plea agreement because he's facing very, very long jail time if convicted. Andrea Mitchell, we'll look for more of your reporting tonight on Nightly News. Andrea, thank you so much thank for being you. with us. In New York, hundreds of people today gathering for the funeral of Jordan Neely, the street performer who was killed after he was put in a chokehold on a subway in that city earlier this month. Here you see members of Neely's family showing up. Emotional hugging, of course, very difficult day for them. Reverend Al Sharpton saying in the eulogy that Neely did not deserve to die on that subway train. We keep criminalizing people with mental illness. People keep criminalizing people that need help. They don't need abuse. They need help. Sharpton, adding that Neely's killing represents how the city's systems are, in his words, choking the mentally ill. At one moment, people in the audience started chanting. Listen. No justice, no peace, they're saying. That chant, likely about the case against the person you see here, Daniel Penny, the 24-year-old Marine vet seen on video putting Neely in the chokehold that killed him. He is facing a single second-degree manslaughter charge and says he's innocent. The Criminal Defense Fund for Penny has raised more than $2.5 million just so far with people like Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, Kid Rock donating. Haley even calling on New York Governor Kathy Hochul to pardon Penny. I want to bring in Rahima Ellis in New York City. And Rahima, it, an emotional and difficult day for the people who knew and loved Jordan Neely. 
It absolutely was. There was a solemn uh, feeling around here, even while in some places there was celebration, remembering him meeting Jordan Neely as a street performer, uh, who was a Michael Jackson impersonator. So some of his music was being played while the funeral was underway. But inside of this church, the very church where Neely's mother was eulogized in 2007 when she was murdered, and the very uh, Baptist minister who presided over that funeral, presided over this one. None of that was lost about the tragic irony of what, what was going on and what has happened for this 30-year-old man, Jordan Neely. And people saying much of what you heard Reverend Al say today, and that was about this was a young man who died too soon, and according to the Reverend it was because he was homeless and mentally ill. Take a listen. We can't live in a city where you can choke me to death with no provocation, no weapon, no threat, and you go home and sleep in your bed while my family got to put me in a cemetery. There must be equal justice under the law. They also called for the justice in terms of helping the mentally ill, uh, Hallie, saying probably everybody in this country knows someone or has a family member who is struggling with mental illness. With that being true, he asked the question of why isn't there more support to, vi to provide more supportive services right. for the mentally ill. You are, pick, you, you are talking about something, Rahema, that has been so important, as you know, to the people in and around Jordan Neely's life, right? The idea of this discussion over who is responsible for safety on the subways. What about care for people who are unhoused, who have mental health conditions? There's been support for Neely, but there's also support, as we saw from some of those big names, backing the man accused of killing Neely. Talk about the sort of Daniel Penny piece of it, the overlay, the context there, and where this goes. Oh, absolutely. You called out some of the names. She's yeah. running for uh, the the GOP presidential nomination. That's Nikki Haley, the straw, the the star, Kid Rock. They're donating to this GoFund Go GoFundMe page that's set up by the Legal Defense Fund for uh, Daniel Penny, and even Governor Ron DeSantis. He shared a link to that page, and he tweeted something to the effect of saying, "We must stop." pro-criminal agenda and take back the streets for law-abiding citizens. That is resonating with some people, you point out. That statement and others have already raised $2.6 million and counting. Now, we should also say that the Manhattan District Attorney, he's still investigating this case. And yeah. there are reports that he may yet consider presenting it to the grand jury. Whether he does or he doesn't, one thing we know for sure, there is already a scheduled date for Daniel Penny to return to the court, and that's on July 17th, Hallie. Rahema Ellis, live for us there in New York City. Rahema, thank you. We are learning tonight that new charges against former President Donald Trump could come in early August. Maybe in the Georgia investigation in the possible election interference by Mr. Trump back during the 2020 election. We don't know like 100 percent for sure, right? This is a bit of the reading of the tea leaves here. You've got the Fulton County DA, you see her on the left side of your screen, asking the chief judge of the court not to schedule any in-person hearings or trials in the first few weeks of August. So people are looking at that and they're like, well, what could be happening there in the first few weeks of August? Maybe these charges. You know that Mr. Trump is officially running for president. So is the person you see now, apparently, Republican Senator Tim Scott, as of a few hours ago, filing paperwork with the FEC to seal the 2024 deal as far as his candidacy and launching this huge $6 million ad campaign in the key states of Iowa and New Hampshire. Timing here, all very interesting, because remember, just 24 hours ago, NBC News was the first to report that Ron DeSantis is set to formally announce his presidential run sometime next week. I want to bring in NBC News senior national politics reporter John Allen. So let me start with... The Trump of it all, um, because as always, he is the one who is looming over the entire Republican Party here. If charges come in early August, like I'm doing the math in my head, going, OK, could that happen? We don't know for sure that's when they could come, if they come at all. But that date is circled on our calendars. At that point, you will likely have a full slate of Republican primary contenders. We know that the first Republican primary deb debate is at some point in August, right? I mean, there's a bit of a collision course here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could see Donald Trump charged uh, within hours or days of 
uh, the first Republican primary debate. And remember, he has hinted that he may not participate in that debate. And to your point about him right. booming over the rest of the field, we're seeing polling recently with him as much as 61 percent of the Republican primary elected to Sanis, uh, down to like 18, 19 percent. So uh, well, last time he got hit with charges, he went up in polls right, in absolutely. the Republican primary. Right. I mean, the answer for Republican primary voters to pollsters is the more uh, Donald Trump gets in trouble uh, legally, uh, the more they're attracted to him. What would the charges be? There had been a lot of discussion, and I think people know that there are a number of, of investigations that Donald Trump faces here. We saw that indictment as it related to this sort of hush money payment case. We saw the civil case, and we're looking at sort of the web of investigations here. There was that um, we found liable of sexual abuse in a separate case. Uh, that was the, the E. Jean Carroll case. The Fulton County, Georgia case is one that legal experts have sort of pointed to as saying, yeah, this could be somewhat serious for him. What, are we lo what is he looking at here, potentially? Yeah, I mean, it's it's unclear what the ch charges will be. Like, I don't want to prejudge exactly what the prosecutor would bring. However— How could you? Your name is—you are not the Fulton County <laughs> District Attorney. Yes. Correct. However, um, I think what they're looking at and why, the, why people think this is serious and there may be a good case against Donald Trump is uh, we all saw what he said about wanting— more votes. And we all know— He told the Secretary of State at the time to find the votes. Find the 12,000-plus right. votes, right? So there's something of a smoking gun there that's been in the public realm for quite a while. And then in addition to that, um, this whole scheme of fake electors that uh, the DA has been looking into, um, it, the question of Donald Trump's involvement in that, uh, we heard Ronna McDaniel, uh, the RNC chair, testify that uh, President Trump had uh, introduced her to one of the folks that was, like, pursuing some of these uh, alternate elector schemes. So um, there's a lot there that we already know. Uh, the question of whether there's a charge and what that charge is uh, remains to be seen. And what about the Tim Scott of it all, right? And I mentioned him because, obviously, the paperwork getting filed today, he's got that big ad campaign. Um, what's his lane? Uh, you know, the good news for Tim Scott is that he's going to have a lot of money backing him. <laughs> he is uh, very close to uh, Larry Ellison, who is, I think, the fifth or sixth richest uh, person in the United States. And so uh, Tim Scott's going to be able to, to campaign for quite a while and see if he sticks in uh, Iowa or New Hampshire. I think for a lot of these candidates, what they've seen is uh, the Ron DeSantis uh, bubble start to burst a little bit. We've, they've seen some deflation of his poll numbers, mm. and they're hoping to get into that place where it's them one-on-one -on -one with Trump. DeSantis has wanted to be one-on-one -on -one with Trump. Yeah. Uh, but what we're seeing right now is a field that is growing, not shrinking. Ron DeSantis next week will get in. Uh, Mike Pence may get in uh, by the end of June. Uh, several other candidates are looking at it right now. So, um, you know, Tim Scott will have an opportunity to make his case. Uh, but right now, Donald Trump is the prohibitive favorite to win the Republican nomination for a third straight time. John Allen, good to see you. Thank you very much. Appreciate good to see it. You, We've got some breaking news to report, some difficult breaking news for fans of the NFL, with word tonight that one of the greatest players of all time, Jim Brown, has died. His wife, Monique, announcing the news in an Instagram post, saying he was an activist, an actor, and a football star, but to us, a loving and wonderful husband, father, and grandfather, and that their hearts are broken. Brown was 87. He was an icon for a sport just starting to claim the national spotlight at the time. The NFL wasn't back then what it was today, right? He was rushing for something like 12,000 yards for the Cleveland Browns across eight seasons. He's an NFL champ, a three-time MVP, a Hall of Famer. Aaron Gilchrist is joining us now. And start there, right? Because he really was, in some ways, the first football superstar in this country um, at an era when we were people were just starting to get used to like what a Super Bowl looked like. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Number six in the draft that year, 1957, he went to play for the Cleveland Browns. And as you said, he was an instant superstar in the NFL uh, in so many ways. A prolific player, as you noted, setting all sorts of records as a running back. And, and you mentioned three times uh, as the MVP, including his rookie year in the NFL, which I believe he may still be the only player to have done that in their rookie year. But he set records for rushing yards, for rushing touchdowns, was just an impressive player all around as a receiver as a kick returner. Uh, he was really an athlete's athlete in so many ways. We know, Hallie, that he retired uh, after just a few years, not even 10 years playing professional football. He retired in 1966 to pursue a, a movie career where he was also very successful. He was shooting the Dirty Dozen in London when he said, I'm done with football. I'm going to concentrate on things that are, as he said, more stimulating at the time. And so he went on to pursue that movie career starring in more than 30 films, Hallie. I'm, I'm not old enough to have remembered playing him him playing football, but I did see him in I'm Gonna Get You Sucker back in the 80s, and he was a funny actor, too, so just he excelled at everything he did.
and a civil rights leader, right? I mean, bringing together people um, in that area, some leaders, some in that era, I should say, to protest the Vietnam War, for example. I mean, the the the, the, the breadth of what he did covered far more than just sports. Yeah, you're absolutely right. A civil rights, a civil rights leader for sure. He led other black athletes uh, at that time. Uh, Bill Russell, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, as we know now. You can see in the photo here, they uh, had what was called the Cleveland Summit at the time, where they went to hear Muhammad Ali explain why he refused to be drafted uh, into the U.S. military to go to, 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 to participate in the Vietnam War. And ultimately, this group of black athletes sided with Muhammad Ali, decided to stand by him. And it was really a watershed moment for the civil rights movement as it relates to black athletes sort of standing up and making uh, making their voices heard collectively at that moment. But Bill, uh, uh, Jim Brown went on, went on to uh, form other organizations to support black businesses. He, he worked to stop gang violence and help young people uh, meet their potential, as he say, as they say. So uh, this was really a, a man who made a name for himself in so many different ways, obviously as an athlete, but also in impacting the lives of other people. Hallie, there were controversies as well that surrounded him during during the course of his life, but uh, as you can see today, the Cleveland Browns, Syracuse, the university he went to, really celebrate, celebrating uh, his football career and his life. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you so much for that. Coming up later in the show, much more to get to, including why a seven-foot-tall basketball superstar has somehow been really hard to find for people trying to sue him. That's coming up. Plus, parts of the U.S. getting ready for a ton of wildfire smoke in the air, where it's coming from, and what it means for your weekend plans, what you should know next. Today, the U.S. is sending help to Canada with smoke from these huge wildfires moving into parts of this country. Check out some of this video from today of what one of those fires in Alberta looks like. I mean, look at that, right? It is getting smoked, I mean, literally, with firefighters trying to contain everything here. You're seeing some of the planes flying overhead as they're trying to get a handle on these. Some 10,000 people have been forced out of their homes. And they're not getting relief anytime soon. These fires are expected to keep burning throughout the weekend. Look at this map here, right? This is our side of the border. You can see where the smoke from these fires is already affecting air quality, down to Colorado even. Check out what it looks like in North Dakota. I mean, that's the air in Bismarck, North Dakota. It is at unhealthy levels, according to officials there. In Canada, something like 212 active wildfires burning as of the last 24 hours. 73 of those fires are still out of control. George Solis is joining us now. This is an intense wildfire season. It is an early wildfire season for this part of Western Canada here, right? Yeah, Hallie, it's really alarming when you look at all of those images that you're seeing, not just the wildfires themselves, but then the smoke that's obviously blanketing Western Canada and as it moves into the United States. And one thing that all experts are agreeing with right now is that this is the effect of climate change right now. There are some uh, discrepancies, some saying, you know, it could be worse, it could be better, depending on the time of year. But one thing that they are saying is like, yes, obviously what we're seeing are the impacts of climate change. One thing that I want to pull up right there is some of our own reporting from one of the uh, experts who did some of the research here, Nathan Gillette, a research scientist with the Environmental and Climate Change Canada who contributed. He says that what's happening here is an extreme event, but less so in comparison to 2021 when we saw, of course, that rampant heat that, of course, claimed lots of lives in the Pacific Northwest. Are we there yet? too early to say, again, according to some analysts. But this record heat obviously spurring these wildfires, some out of control, as you mentioned. And now we're all dealing with the effects, particularly in the Midwest, the Rockies, the Great Plains, as that smoke starts to impact the air quality, the messaging from a lot of these experts. Of course, this particular weekend, if you don't have to go outside, stay indoors because it could be a detriment to your health, Hallie. I mean, you look at some of those images, even from North Dakota, right? Nobody wants to go outside when it's looking like that. It's not just the impact on people's health. There is a sort of a, a business impact, too. Yeah, believe it or not, there's a lot of oil that's being produced in this uh, area of Canada and Alberta specifically. So you have the impact of oil production. Uh, we know for a fact that at least 240 barrels of oil cannot be pumped right now in the region. And that's because Chevron and Paramount Resources together shut down out of an abundance of caution re recently. And then the production of about 2.7 million barrels of oil per day are in what's called the very high or extreme wildfire danger zone. So is it going to contribute to that pain in the pump that we like to reference? Likely so, because again, while this is all ongoing and some of these fires are out of control, that means these plants are going to stay offline as long. 
The only silver lining, if you will, here, Hallie, is that Canadian officials say no one has died. But as you mentioned, they are pumping so many resources into this region to get some of these fires under control. But uh, whether they achieve that, given the magnitude of what we're seeing, obviously remains to be seen. Hallie. That's still an open question. George, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Blue Origin, that Jeff Bezos venture, has been given a massive contract from NASA to build a new moon lander. It'll carry astronauts to the moon as part of the Artemis program, still a ways away, 2029. NASA's going to pay more than $3.4 billion for the project, even though Blue Origin estimates it'll cost closer to $7 billion. It means Bezos will foot about half the bill. Number two, more than 33 million Americans may be driving cars with airbag inflators that can explode in a crash and basically spew out pieces of deadly metal. Federal regulators are demanding that the parts manufacturer, a company called ARC Automotive, issue a recall, but the company is not doing that. Two people have been killed by airbag shrapnel so far, and at least seven others have been hurt. Number three, a fourth person has died from a bacterial outbreak linked to a brand of eye drops. New data from the CDC shows 81 people have now been infected because of this. More than a dozen have actually gone blind in at least one eye. It's a strain of bacteria that's resistant to antibiotics. You're looking at the brand here, EzraCare Artificial Tears. That's the product that health experts have linked to this bacteria. They say don't use it. If you're using it, please stop. Number four, the second leg of the Triple Crown, the Preakness, is set for tomorrow afternoon. One of the favorites, a horse named First Mission, was just removed from the race because of a potential leg injury. There's a lot of eyes on the winner of the Kentucky Derby to see if that horse will stay ahead of the field. Of course, with a lot of questions and a big spotlight on the health of horses in the racing industry right now. Um, the local NBC station, wherever you watch, will be carrying the Preakness. Number five, lawyers are apparently having a tough time getting a hold of Shaq. They want to serve him a lawsuit brought by FTX investors. Shaq's one of a number of celebrities who showed up in ads for that now failed, now collapsed crypto exchange. But somehow the seven foot one TV star who regularly appears on television has evaded them for months. The Wall Street Journal reports they even tried throwing the stack of papers at Shaq's car. But Shaq's lawyers were like, that doesn't count. Still ahead here on the show, destruction at a Michigan cemetery. We're going to tell you what led to a car chase in a graveyard, if you can believe it, later in the local. And some foreign businesses in China are getting some unwelcome visits from officials cracking down. We'll tell you why and the potential chilling effect that's having next. Locals woken up in the middle of the night because of tremors from an earthquake. Where it happened may surprise you. But first, a series of raids on big international consulting firms in Beijing seems to have a lot of U.S. CEOs on edge, saying they want to bring their business to China, but they're afraid to do that. Just last week, the consultant's CapVision became the latest U.S. company to be raided by Chinese official in what's been described as a crackdown on foreign businesses. This is after raids at some other American-based firms, including Mintz Group, an investigative firm, and top management consulting firm Bain & Company. Bain, you know Bain. Chinese state media says the raids have been done in the interest of national security, claiming that some Western countries have been stealing intel about China's military and its economy. Janice Mackey Freyer is joining us now. There are so many pieces of this here. That's like an onion, right? Layers and layers and layers. There's already kind of a bit of a, um, uh, I, I, I think fair to say, sensitive diplomatic dance being done as it relates to the U.S.-China relationship here. What are you hearing when it comes to businesses in China? American businesses trying to operate there with this latest sort of round of what seems to be crackdowns. Well, businesses are definitely on edge with this. Uh, the CEOs or the business leaders here that I've spoken to have said that China has traditionally been a place where there has been rules, clarity, transparency, and that has encouraged FDI in the past. And with these raids, that has gone away. And with that, uh, any confidence uh, that businesses have in the current environment here. Uh, what happened with this latest raid is we saw Chinese security agents swoop down on several offices of CapVision. This is a business consultancy. They deal in economic data for mergers, for acquisitions. But this is now information that Chinese authorities have now deemed potentially sensitive with national security considerations. What it's done is that it's moved the goalposts for American companies 
but they're not sure where those goalposts have been moved to. Uh, I spoke with Michael Hart. He is the president of AmCham China. That's the American Chamber of Commerce here about the impact. What we understand is the companies that have been targeted were those that were doing due diligence for potential mergers and acquisitions or collecting data for companies trying to understand um, you know, the economics around their business. So, if, again, if you can't collect information, how can you run and manage a business? How can you plan future investment if you can't do due diligence on your future partners? Now, I was also told that they recently did a visit to Washington, D.C. They met with policymakers, they met with CEOs, and they said they were told at least a dozen times by CEOs that they want to come to China, they want to check in with their business in China, they want to continue to invest in China, but right now, they're afraid to come to China, Hallie. So we're going to see this chill take effect at a time when U.S.-China relations are also not in their best spot. The rationale is also kind of interesting here, right? Because Chinese officials, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but Chinese officials are basically saying, hey, like, this is a national security thing. We believe that some of these Western companies might be stealing, you know, stealing things they shouldn't as it relates to Intel, for example, about companies. Even though China has been accused of doing the same thing in other nations, right? Well, and also at a time when China is trying to bolster its economy, it's trying to lure business back after three years of uh, COVID restrictions that kept most uh, companies out, uh, and at a time when there are other sensitivities in a very restrictive security environment with exit bans, with uh, some visa restrictions. So all of this now feeding into an environment where U.S. Co US con uh, companies are beginning to lose confidence and trust in the Chinese system. Janice Mackey Fryer, live for us from Beijing. Janice, it's a fascinating look uh, behind the curtain there. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Still to come, maybe you're a Swifty, maybe you're a member of the Beehive. Then you know the arm and a leg you'd have to give up for some tickets. Until now, question mark, maybe? We're looking into it for you. Plus, Major League Baseball players not just hurting from their physical injuries. We've got an in-depth look at the increasing focus on mental health in the big leagues in tonight's original. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we're talking baseball. Now, when you hear about your favorite players going on the injured list, you're probably thinking, okay, pulled a hammy, tore an ACL, like some kind of a physical thing that pains them. But nearly a third of the way into the season, three players have spent time on the injured list to treat their mental health. One of them, Colorado pick Rockies pitcher Daniel Bard, is opening up with our own Jesse Kirsch on why he needed to step away from the game. When you can throw a baseball close to 100 miles per hour, there's no question you're already a game changer. But this spring, Colorado Rockies star pitcher Daniel Bard changed the game in another way without throwing a single pitch. Normally, I thrive under that pressure. When I started to feel like I was getting those, that, those same emotions, but they were becoming negative, they weren't helping me, they were hurting me, I knew something wasn't right. Bard was battling anxiety ahead of opening day. He could have tried pushing through it, but instead, the 37-year-old reliever did something rarely seen in professional sports. He shared his struggle publicly, starting the season on the injured list to focus on his mental health. The Rockies say he missed 18 games before returning last month. It was just the anticipation of having to perform every day and not feeling confident in, in my ability to do that thing. Bard's one of three MLB players to openly take time off for their mental health this season. But that may be a serious undercount. Teams will never admit it, but they come up with fake injuries all the time for players when they need a break. Sports writer Danielle Allentuck says that can be for multiple issues, including mental health. There are probably a lot more of them out there. I think there's probably, you know, dozens, you know, three to four on every team every season. So why did Bard speak up? He says it took some pressure off, looped in his teammates and fans and helped him set an example for his kids. Whether it's mental health or otherwise, just letting them know that you can you can face hard things, you know, whatever that is. So hopefully they'll speak up. Hope so, or just, you know, use it in their life to, to, get, to get through something. After life's latest curveball, Bard's now back on the mound for the Rockies, an organization he says has been supportive. Clubs are hearing and, and listening to what's happening with their players. No doubt about that. And they're hiring psychologists, mental skill coaches, people who are trained to help players in this regard. The stigma has dropped, and so we are seeing more and more people 
saying, you know what, why wouldn't I work on this? In a statement, Major League Baseball telling NBC, we've been proud of our longstanding work in this space to provide players with support. MLB says it also just launched a new youth-focused mental health and wellness program. When things are good, you kind of walk out and you have this thought of, this is what I was born to do. I'm one of the best in the world. Let's go do this. Bard's journey resonating with some fans. I think it sends an incredible message for those that also need help. And, you know, and so it's like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. If somebody has a tweak to hamstring, you're not going to ask him to go sprint on it every day to see if it gets better. If you view mental health kind of the same way, especially in sports, but really in, in, in any area, I think you'll see a lot of these issues that deal with it and get back to being, being yourself. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now live. It is so fascinating to hear Daniel Bard talk about this, right? And I think it's important for people to know, it's not like he's a rookie. He's been in the majors for 15 years. It's also not his first sort of struggle with anxiety. He's been through something like this before. I wonder how it's different now for him than it was maybe a decade ago, right, when it comes to the mental health journey and being open about it. Yeah, and people should really look into his story because he has this incredible comeback story, Howie. Uh, bottom line is from uh, somewhere in 2013 until 2020, he was not playing Major League Baseball. He took all that time off. He was trying to stay in the majors, but he was dealing with something called the yips where he was having trouble uh, even having a simple game of catch. And obviously, as a pitcher, when you were trying to hit a very precise target, that's not going to work. So he was able to get back to the majors. And I asked him, looking back on that time when he was struggling with the yips, was he also dealing with anxiety then? And he says yes. And I asked him what he wishes he could say to himself from back then from about a decade ago and he says he wishes that someone was there to tell him that it's okay to take the time off talk to the right people and get the help you need he says he got pretty good at toughing it out and wasn't really addressing the anxiety which was part of he says the challenges he was facing all those years ago and obviously now he took that time and he's back to throwing on the mound Hallie Great reporting. Jesse Kirsch, thank you so much for bringing us tonight's original. Really appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Midwest Bureau, check it out, this Michigan car chase. Yes, it ended inside a cemetery with a trail of destruction. Police were going after a carjacking suspect in Dearborn right before the crash. You can see there were, like, broken headstones, different things scattered across the graveyard, which was established back in the 1800s, the 1850s. No confirmation from police if any arrests has been made. Out of our D.C. Bureau, a pretty scary scene this morning after a BMW crashed into a school bus in Maryland. One adult, one child inside the car were rushed to the hospital. At least six middle school, middle school students were on the bus at the time. None of them seemed to have been seriously hurt, at least for the students. The people in the car apparently have life-threatening injuries. Out of our Northeast Bureau, a rare but small earthquake rattled, of all places, New York City overnight. It was only a 2.2 quake centered in the town of Hastings on Hudson. That's like north of Manhattan. So I don't know if that's the city, but it's like north of the city. No damage is being reported, but uh, our New York friends tell us that social media lit up with people who were like, what's that shaking? Strange. Coming up here on the show, we spent a lot of time telling you how expensive and difficult it is to get tickets to some big concerts and games, but there may be a way to get them for a steal. That's what we got when we come back. Welcome to Massachusetts, Taylor Swift. It has been waiting for you and waiting and waiting and waiting as her hugely popular Eras tour pulls into New England tonight for a few shows. Then it's on to New York, where she could play for some of her biggest crowds yet. Now, tons of Swifties in the Northeast are battling out over last-minute tickets, and you know that is not cheap. You know that how not cheap is that? Our team looked, looked everywhere online, cheapest they could find, $2,000 per on the resale site. That is a lot of money. And because there is so much demand here, that's why, right? The resellers who got those tickets early are reselling them now for like a ton of cash. So what do you do, right? If, if the price is skyrocketing because there's so much demand, are you just totally out of luck? You're going to miss the show? What's up with that, right? What do you do? NBC's Noah Pransky got this assignment for us. Lucky you, Noah. You've been watching it. What's happening with these ticket prices, right? And this is not totally unexpected. This is something that, you know, when there's a sold-out show and there's resellers who can resell them online, price gets jacked up. That clearly seems to be what's happening here, right? What if you don't have two grand to spend on a ticket? Are you done? Uh, well, if you want to sacrifice a mortgage payment, you can get right in. But this is the kind of thing we see often for big sporting events, big concerts. Take a look at the numbers from the New York concert next Friday night, for example. We are looking at the single cheapest seat 
$2,100 to get in. You want a good seat? That's not like, even you want good to be able to, seat. Uh, you want to be able to see her face, $2,400 and up. So I've got three quick tips for you here. For any big show, you want to take advantage of inventory if you care where you sit. Early on, there's a lot more tickets available. So if you want to sit with friends, you want specific seats, get on it early, the prices will tend to go up. Tip number two, this is almost contrary to it, the last minute strategy. It is not for the faint of heart, but if you want to wait till the very last minute, we do typically see prices crash at the very last as people dump tickets. I'm looking right now at the Foxborough tickets for tonight in Massachusetts, under $900 for a single ticket. That's down 60% from 48 hours ago. And the last tip here is you can city shop. Maybe your city is expensive, but maybe another city in the country is not, especially for Beyonce tickets or Taylor Swift. Look at the prices in Cincinnati. $1,000 less for a ticket, that's enough to pay for your airfare and hotel and a night in Cincinnati. So go for it, hop on a plane. Yeah, 600 bucks for a night in Cincinnati. That's a hell of a night there. Um, you know, I mean, obviously the big drawback with that strategy, the last minute strategy, you go to Foxborough tonight, you're going by yourself. like. Sure, you'll probably make friends, but something to consider. I'm in Washington, so you know I'll ask this through a Washington lens, right? Because President Biden has talked about a ban on some of these fees, like for tickets, et cetera. What's the latest there? So Congress doesn't like to do anything quickly. So instead, the Biden administration has actually been working with state legislatures, making a lot of progress, banning some of these junk fees or forcing transparency. And also public pressure is also doing a good, a de good deal on this. So what we're seeing is it's more transparent now. Junk fees are bad. You hate getting nickel and dime by ticket companies, by hotels, by your internet company. But what's even worse is when it's not truth in pricing and it's not disclosed up front. So at least we're getting more transparency and in some states, we're actually getting a, a ban on them. Noah Pransky, thank you. Appreciate it. Good that does it for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air with Republicans, in their words, pressing pause on these talks with the White House that have the global economy hanging in the balance. President Biden projecting confidence from 7,000 miles away as he's cutting deals to send fighter jets to Ukraine. We're going to take you live to Washington and Japan with the latest. Also tonight, we're learning the service member accused of leaking a ton of top secret, top secret documents. will have to stay behind bars in jail until his trial starts. How prosecutors are using his own words against him. Plus, new pressure on the FBI tonight with new court documents showing agents may have broken the rules looking up people during the George Floyd protest and that January 6th attack. The new statement just in from the FBI in the last maybe six minutes here. Then the wild video we're getting from fires in the Canadian wilderness. Smoke drifting across the border to the U.S. fast. What does this tell us about wildfire season as a whole, and what should people know for the weekend? Plus, how the movie business is trying to court older folks by de-aging some of their biggest stars, like Harrison Ford. Why audiences seem to prefer older actors, even when they themselves are young, later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and pretty soon President Biden and the other G7 leaders will hear a new plea for help directly from Ukraine's president, as we're learning tonight about a new agreement to give high-powered fighter jets to help in his war with Russia. But as he's cutting deals on foreign issues, there are some key talks here at home on a bigger domestic front, potentially, right? Something to prevent economic catastrophe. And right now, those talks are hitting some snags, hitting a bit of a roadblock. Right now, you've got the lead negotiator for Republicans, Congressman Garrett Graves. You see him here walking out of the Capitol, not sounding super duper thrilled with how the talks are going to make sure that this country can pay its bills on time. Listen to how he's framing it here. Until people are willing to have reasonable conversations about how you can actually move forward and do the right thing, then we're not going to sit here and talk to ourselves. Not going to sit here and talk to ourselves, he says. Now, the White House is the other side of the negotiating table, with a spokesperson telling our team, look, there is a path forward here, but it is a difficult path. They're trying to project kind of a longer-term calm with this shorter-term frustration because of differences on both sides. We're going to get the view on these talks from the White House perspective from Mike Memoli, who's live for us in Japan in just a second. But we want to start on Capitol Hill with Julie Serkin. Um, where is this, right? Because right now, the so-called X date, the day when the U.S. is going to hit up on this deadline to run out of money to pay its bills, is June 1st, most likely, as early as June 1st. Um, that is not that long away, right? So it is not, we're not talking fatal blows territory for these talks yet, but it's not exactly smooth sailing either, far from it. 
Yeah, it's really not great when you have that deadline looming less than two weeks away and Speaker McCarthy is out of this building with both talks appearing to be, both sides appearing to be at an impasse here. Now, the biggest disagreement here is overspending caps. Right now, the Republicans having passed their Republican-led uh, plan and backed plan, they want that spending to go back to 2022 levels. Big problem there, though, for Democrats and the White House to accept that. That means it erases and unravels basically everything Democrats were able to accomplish in their Inflation Reduction Act. It's something the president is certainly running on when he considers uh, the second term and the campaign is in full swing with just a year and a half until 2024. Here's McCarthy before he walked out of the building explaining some of that. Watch. Yesterday I really felt we were at the location where I could see the path. The, the White House is just, look, we can't be spending more money next year. We have to spend less than we spent the year before. It's pretty easy. We have to spend less here, Hallie. That's not so easy to do when you have the president and Democrats still not considering spending cuts and a debt limit increase, but Republicans are saying, hey, we passed this bill, and by the way, they're listening to their conservative members. Can I take the, you have so capably and expertly, Julie, as you cover this every single day, laid out sort of the, the spool of thread here. Let me tug on it, because I want to make sure it's clear. Explain why you, you, you talk about how spending caps are one of the same. Explain what a spending cap is. Like, put this in super plain English, right? Because I think people here, this is about the, this is not about future spending. This is about the U.S. making good on the bills it already assessed, right? You get your power bill, you have to pay it. You use that electricity, like, you're on the hook for that money. Same deal here. So, when we talk about spending caps, even though that's something that a lot of DC people talk about, it is essential. I'll let you explain it. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, go right ahead. You're doing a great job. Look, a spending cup is a cap, essentially, every single year lawmakers get together and pass a budget. So these are two separate issues that we're talking about here right. that McCarthy is trying to string together, right? The debt ceiling and the budget are two very different things, but Republicans want them to ride together. So what McCarthy and Republicans are saying here, and they said as much in their House passed bill, is that they want to go back to 2022 levels. That means undoing everything Democrats passed, undoing some of those tax credits for clean energy, for example. Uh, undoing uh, other things and instead implementing things like work requirements, essentially making it uh, more difficult or putting more restrictions on people to prove that they are working enough to qualify for some social safety net programs. So what Republicans want here is to go back to 2022 levels. Something they're going to be able to swallow is between 2022 and 2023, which is the bill they just passed in December to fund the government going forward. So these are two separate conversations Republicans want to be having at the same time, whereas Democrats actually want to raise levels, which is a non-starter for conservatives. Julie Sirkin, that is a perfect explanation. Jules, thank you. So, Mem, let me go to you live for us uh, in Hiroshima, Japan, where President Biden is. Julie has laid out where these sticking points are and what, why these two sides are far apart at the moment. But what time is it there? Do we have our live clock? What is it, 6 in the morning, something like that? I don't know. But it's <laughs> breakfast time where you are. Presumably, President Biden is just kind of, 7 a.m., just kind of waking up to the news here that Garrett Graves walked out of the Capitol and says, we're hitting pause. Like, what? Where does this go in the hours to come, the overnight hours here, the daytime hours here? Because we know that the president is trying to stay engaged. The White House is trying to show, by putting up pictures of him working, that he's staying engaged in these talks. Yeah, Hallie, this is really a good illustration for why the White House ultimately <coughs> cut this trip short. He was supposed to be here halfway around the world for another five, six days. And when you think about the eight hours that have transpired between when these talks broke down and when the president is, as you say, probably just getting read in now on what happened, that's a lot of time lost when there's not a lot of time to lose. And so as we're reading between the lines of all the White House comments today on the record, off the record, background statements we're getting from different White House officials, what the White House is essentially saying is, listen, we know Speaker McCarthy has a problem at his conference. They're not ever going to get unanimity behind whatever deal ultimately both sides can try to come to here. And so they're asking Speaker McCarthy to appreciate that he's going to need a lot of Democratic votes. And in order to get them, he's going to have to give in a little bit more than he is. We just heard from Vice President Kamala Harris, um, who is obviously here. She took a question on the pause in the debt ceiling negotiations. Basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, it says the White House will continue to operate in good faith, you know, that no matter what, and we've heard this from the White House for ages now, so the U.S. should not default on our debt. Remember, that has, I don't have to remind you, that has never happened. We don't, we don't really know what the consequences of this will be if it turns out this deadline hits and we can't pay our bills because nobody has actually had that happen before. Um, 
give us a landscape of the next like 12 days here because you're right president biden's coming back earlier they're going to engage you're going to have these talks you're going to work out or not work out these sticking points here congress and sometimes the white house sometimes need deadlines right are we going up to may 31st here is that your sense that's right well, what's so interesting, Hallie, is this morning or last night, depending on what time it is for, for me here, uh, it's been confusing in the hours that I'm keeping. Uh, a White House official was saying to me, really, as they were optimistic about where things were heading, that this is not going to be 2011. And what they meant by that is this is not going to go to the 11th hour, because as you remember, that's the closest we did get to a default. And even though a deal was reached, it still rattled the markets. It still led to a downgrade that's in right. our credit. And so that was optimism that maybe they'd get to a deal even early and they were talking about the president flying home after talking to Speaker McCarthy with sort of a, a framework on the table. That's clearly, at least it seems, not going to happen yeah. now. And potentially this is also one of those moments in a negotiation where both sides have to walk away to, to show to their own respective corners that they're fighting for everything that they want to get. So this might just be a cooling off period as much as it looks like a, 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 a real uh, breakdown in the talks. Totally get it, but just real talk here, ma'am. Your sources may say to you and the White House may say to you, like, you know, this isn't going to be 2011. We don't know. That's right. That's right. We don't know. And it's in part, I think, a factor of both of the parties now. Think back to the Republican Party of 2011. Speaker John Boehner with uh, Deputy Paul Ryan there in the wings on the Budget Committee. This is a different House with a lot more of that, as the White House would put it, MAGA extreme base. Mm. We know it took 15 ballots for Speaker McCarthy to become Speaker, and we know he's on a very short leash. One vote could pull him out of the Speakership. And, and so it's a much different landscape in the House. That is for sure politically different uh, as well. Mike Memoli live for us there uh, at 7 o'clock in the morning there in Hiroshima, Japan, where time is apparently a flat circle for you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. So a judge tonight is ruling to keep a Massachusetts Air National Guardsman accused of leaking top secret Pentagon documents online in jail. He's going to have to stay in jail until his trial starts instead of getting released to his dad's house like his lawyers had wanted. Our reporter inside court telling us the judge sided with prosecutors because Jack Teixeira, you see him here, the judge says had been trusted with top secret stuff and knew that what he was doing could hurt the U.S. He referenced some evidence that the government's lawyers filed earlier this week where they said Teixeira's bosses caught him taking notes on top secret documents, doing deep dives on stuff that wasn't even relevant to his job. He got in trouble, but he kept his job and he kept his access to classified information. Teixeira's family in a statement tonight saying they're disappointed in this outcome and that there is a long road ahead of us all. Courtney QB is joining us live now. Some pretty tough words from the judge here, right? Saying that the evidence the government brought was strong. He said, when you look at who to share put at risk, you could make a list as long as a phone book here. I mean, it is no surprise when you hear comments like that, that the judge said, hey, guy, you got to stay behind bars. Yeah, that's right. And he even referenced specific people who may, or groups of people who may have been harmed or may still be harmed based off of some of these classified Pentagon documents that Teixeira is, uh, is alleged, allegedly leaked. And that includes members of the U.S. military, Ukrainian citizens, and even some non-governmental organizations that operate throughout the world. And what's important to remember here, Hallie, is the documents that Teixeira is accused of leaking here literally span the entire world. But the judge, as you said, using really strong language to talk about what he said was very, very strong uh, mm. evidence against Teixeira. Among the things that he was concerned about, the judge, is Teixeira's fascination with guns. We saw some video from the Washington Post that seemed to show him firing off weapons and using some pretty uh, uh, dis, uh, racist language in this video. But in addition to that, the judge also cited Teixeira's lack of integrity. And what he meant there, what, what he explained to the courtroom today, was that Teixeira knew, he was trained, that, that leaking this kind of classified information and putting it out in the public would potentially harm people. And he signed a non-disclosure that said he understood these rules, but he did it anyway. And the judge even cited several times that Teixeira was completely dismissive about the potential dangers of his actions. Right. The attitude piece seemed to come into play here. He has not yet, Jack Teixeira, I mean, has not yet entered a plea. Um, there is the possibility that an appeal could be on the table, although you, you wonder how that might get squared, Courtney. I mean, his lawyers have the right yeah. to do it at this point. The judge seemed extremely clear from where he stood here. But all of it has raised these questions over, like, protecting classified info, how the U.S. Yeah. does it, what is appropriate, um, and how do you how do you keep that info that needs to be kept safe when it does safe?
And the judge specifically today said, look, he, when he was thinking through this decision, it seemed plausible that Tashera could go to his family, that he could be kept in, in, in a safe way, that he would be able to, you know, not have access to the Internet, and his family would be able to keep up the rules with his uh, home detention. But at the end of the day, the judge said, look, you know, I'm concerned that, that they would— that what would happen if he doesn't follow the rules, that foreign adversaries could potentially get, get access to him. And he said at the end of the day, he just he couldn't let him go. That was what his decision was based on, Hallie. Courtney QB, live for us there with that report in court. Thank you so much. Just in the last couple of minutes, the FBI is out with a new statement responding to some court documents released today that say the FBI did something it shouldn't have done, that it misused information from a big database against crime victims, January 6th riot suspects, people connected to Black Lives, Black Lives Matter protests. So the FBI tonight, um, and in fact, you can see that in these instances, it shows that these documents say that the FBI wrongly looked up information in this digital system for info about Americans and others, something like 278,000 times in 2020 and early 2021, including people arrested at demonstrations over the killing of George Floyd. And these searches continued for months after the Capitol attack. The FBI now, in a statement, says in part, the errors described in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court's opinion are completely unacceptable. And as a result of the audits that revealed these instances of noncompliance, the FBI changed its querying procedures to make sure these errors do not happen again. Guys, basically what the FBI is saying here is like, hey, we fixed the problem, and that's where we go from here. There's never a great time for an acknowledgment like this, but right now may not be a particularly great time for the FBI because some Republicans in Congress want to cut the agency's budget. And at the same time, the FBI is trying to get a law passed that would extend the very authorization they allegedly abused in this instance. Let's get to Ken Delaney for more on this. Okay, Ken, so talk us through targets here, the info the oh. FBI may have gotten in this sort of very extraordinary story. Yeah, Hallie, this is a terrible story, but it's also not as terrible as some of the critics on the far right and the far left are making it out to be. Let me explain. We all remember, or maybe some don't, but in, back in the 1970s, the FBI was essentially a lawless organization when it came to domestic spying. They did horrible things. They bugged Martin Luther King's bedroom. They mm. spied on anti-war opponents and, and a variety of dissidents around the United States. That led to a series of congressional hearings. It was a massive scandal. It led to this Law called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. So now there are a lot of rules around things that the FBI can do when it comes to domestic surveillance. So what happened here is there is a huge database of information gathered for foreign intelligence purposes by the National Security Agency. It's foreigners talking to foreigners abroad. But sometimes they talk to Americans, sometimes they talk about Americans, and so there is some American information in there. And sometimes the FBI queries that database when it has a good legal reason to do so with the names of Americans to see if there are any ties to foreigners in a particular investigation. Well, what happened here is the FBI did that inappropriately on a mass scale in some instances that are very disturbing, frankly. They did it with a lot of January 6 protesters. They did it, according to this document, with 19,000 people who donated to a political campaign because they thought that campaign was subject to foreign influence. And they did it with some Black Lives Matter protesters or people connected to that protest. It's not entirely clear. The FBI says it was essentially a mistake that it, in many cases, information wasn't even accessed from these queries. Again, it's not spying, right? It's, it's querying a name in a database that may or may not come up with information, probably in most cases did not. But nonetheless, it's an abuse of power, and people uh, both on the left, Jerry Nadler, the Democrat mm -hmm. uh, in charge of the uh, ranking Democrat on the House Judiciary Committee, and on the far right, which is very skeptical of the FBI, are, are raising a ruckus here. And it's going to be a big problem, because the FBI, the very law that is at issue here, Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is expiring at the end of this year. And the FBI and other agencies are trying to get it renewed. And by the way, it's the biggest source of intelligence in the United States. It makes up like 75 percent of the presidential daily brief, and it's in peril right now. And now members of Congress are saying, we are not renewing this thing until you guys clean up your act. I mean, listen, Ken, like I hear you when you say, hey, it, you know, it's not the 70s. They're not bugging civil rights leaders bedrooms. Right. But like there is, I think, a level of expectation that Americans have about what their law enforcement agencies are going to do. There is a trust and confidence question mark here. Right. Does the FBI acknowledge that? 
Oh, 100%. They know that this is a terrible story for them. But what they say is, look, the reason you know about this is because we did an audit and we made mm. the results of that audit public through the courts and we have changed the rules on this. Uh, but, you know, the problem with that is they've been saying that for years. They've been saying, trust us, trust us. The FISA process is, is, has integrity and they keep getting caught doing the wrong thing. So there is a trust issue here. But just to emphasize, like, this is not people getting the contents of your email, right? That's not what this is. This is running names against a database that may or may not have some information if you were talking to foreigners. So that's why I say it's much different from bugging somebody's hotel room, Allie. Ken Delaney, and uh, thank you for the contacts. Thank you for all of that. Appreciate it, Ken. You bet. Hundreds of people in New York today gathering for the funeral of Jordan Neely, the street performer who was killed after he was put in a chokehold on a New York City subway earlier this month. You can see members of Neely's family here showing up, obviously, clearly, understandably emotional, hugging. Reverend Al Sharpton saying in the eulogy that Neely did not deserve to die on that subway train. We keep criminalizing people with mental illness. People keep criminalizing people that need help. They don't need abuse. They need help. Sharpton, adding that Neely's killing represents how the city's systems are, in his words, choking the mentally ill. At one moment, people in the audience started chanting. Listen to this. They're saying no justice, no peace, likely about the case against Daniel Penny. He's the 24-year-old Marine veteran seen on video putting Neely in the chokehold that killed him. He's facing a single second-degree manslaughter charge and says he's innocent. The criminal defense fund for Penny has raised more than two and a half million dollars so far with people like Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, Kid Rock all donating. Haley even calling on the New York governor, Kathy Hochul, to pardon Penny. I want to bring in Rahima Ellis, who's live for us in New York City. Talk us through um, the way that people are remembering the life uh, and the legacy of Jordan Neely today. Well, it was in a very solemn way in this church, and I should point out that there's a tragic irony here that this church here on Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard, where Jordan Neely was eulogized today, is the very same church where his mother, who was murdered, was eulogized back in 2007. People say that after that tragedy, Neely's mental health diminished year after year. And then he ended up as what they're calling a victim of crime on the subway. Reverend Sharpton pointed out that there are so many families in America who can relate because they have someone whom they know is also struggling with mental illness. And he asked the question of why then isn't there not more support to help them? Take a listen. We can't live in a city where you can choke me to death with no provocation, no weapon, no threat, and you go home and sleep in your bed while my family got to put me in a cemetery. There must be equal justice under the law. Part of that equal justice, they say, will come with the continued prosecution of Daniel Penny, who, as you point out, is facing a second-degree manslaughter charge. The district attorney is still investigating this case. There are reports that he may well send this case to the to the uh, grand jury. Whether he does or he doesn't, we do know that this case is scheduled to go back and Daniel Penny go back into court on July 17th. And beyond that, part of the justice and without the justice of reform in the mental health opportunities, people say there will be no peace. Rahima Allie. Ellis, live for us there in New York City. Rahima, thank you for being there and for that reporting. We are learning tonight that new charges against former President Donald Trump could come in early August, perhaps, this time in the Georgia investigation into potential election interference by Mr. Trump back in 2020. Now, it's not 100 percent for sure. There is some reading of the tea leaves happening here. And here's why. You've got the Fulton County DA on the left side of your screen. She's asking the chief judge of the court not to schedule any in-person hearings or trials the first few weeks of August. So people see that. They connect the dots. They think, well, why wouldn't you want it? Well, perhaps because these charges are coming. Mr. Trump, of course, is officially running for president. And now, so is this guy you see on screen, Republican Senator Tim Scott, as of a few hours ago, filing paperwork with the FEC to make his 2024 run official and launching a huge $6 million ad campaign in Iowa and New Hampshire. The timing, it's all sort of happening here because just 24 hours ago, 
NBC News was the first to report that Ron DeSantis is set to formally announce his presidential run sometime next week. Let's bring in NBC News senior national politics reporter John Allen. So let me start with the Trump of it all, um, because as always, he is the one who is looming over the entire Republican Party here. If charges come in early August, like I'm doing the math in my head, going, OK, could that happen? We don't know for sure that's when they could come, if they come at all. But that date is circled on our calendars. At that point, you will likely have a full slate of Republican primary contenders. We know that the first Republican primary debate is at some point in August, right? I mean, there's a bit of a collision course here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could see Donald Trump charged uh, within hours or days of uh, the first Republican primary debate. And remember, he has hinted that he may not participate in that debate. And to your point about him right. moving over the rest of the field, we're seeing polling recently with him as much as 61 percent of the Republican primary elected to Sanis, uh, down to like 18, 19 percent. So uh, well, last time he got hit with charges, he went up in polls right, in absolutely. the Republican primary. Right. I mean, the answer for Republican primary voters to polls is the more uh, Donald Trump gets in trouble uh, legally, uh, the more they're attracted to him. What would the charges be? There had been a lot of discussion, and I think people know that there are a number of, of investigations that Donald Trump faces here. We saw that indictment as it related to this sort of hush money payment case. We saw the civil case, and we're looking at sort of the web of investigations here. There was that um, we found liable of sexual abuse in a separate case. Uh, that was the, the E. Jean Carroll case. The Fulton County, Georgia case is one that legal experts have sort of pointed to as saying, yeah, this could be somewhat serious for him. What, are we lo what is he looking at here, potentially? Yeah, I mean, it's it's unclear what the ch charges will be. Like, I don't want to prejudge exactly what the prosecutor would bring. However— How could you? Your name is—you are not the Fulton County <laughs> District Attorney, yes. Correct. However, um, I think what they're looking at and why, the, why people think this is serious and there may be a good case against Donald Trump is uh, we all saw what he said about wanting— more votes. And we all know— He told the Secretary of State at the time to find the votes. Find the 12,000-plus right. votes, right? So there's something of a smoking gun there that's been in the public realm for quite a while. And then in addition to that, um, this whole scheme of fake electors that uh, the DA has been looking into, um, it, the question of Donald Trump's involvement in that, uh, we heard Ronna McDaniel, uh, the RNC chair, testify that uh, President Trump had uh, introduced her to one of the folks that was, like, pursuing some of these uh, alternate elector schemes. So um, there's a lot there that we already know. Uh, the question of whether there's a charge and what that charge is uh, remains to be seen. And what about the Tim Scott of it all, right? And I mentioned him because, obviously, the paperwork getting filed today, he's got that big ad campaign. Um, what's his lane? Uh, you know, the good news for Tim Scott is that he's going to have a lot of money backing him. <laughs> he is uh, very close to uh, Larry Ellison, who is, I think, the fifth or sixth richest uh, person in the United States. And so uh, Tim Scott's going to be able to, to campaign for quite a while and see if he sticks in uh, Iowa or New Hampshire. I think for a lot of these candidates, what they've seen is uh, the Ron DeSantis uh, bubble start to burst a little bit. We've, they've seen some deflation of his poll numbers, mm -hmm. and they're hoping to get into that place where it's them one-on-one -on -one with Trump. DeSantis has wanted to be one-on-one -on -one with Trump. Yeah. Uh, but what we're seeing right now is a field that is growing, not shrinking. Ron DeSantis next week will get in. Uh, Mike Pence may get in uh, by the end of June. Uh, several other candidates looking at it right now. So, um, you know, Tim Scott will have an opportunity to make his case. Uh, but right now, Donald Trump is the prohibitive favorite to win the Republican nomination for a third straight time. John Allen, good to see you. Thank you very much. Appreciate good to see it. You, some sad breaking news to report tonight with arguably the greatest NFL player of all time, Jim Brown. He has died. His wife, Monique, announcing the news in an Instagram post, saying that to the world, he was an activist, an actor, and a football star. But to us, a loving and wonderful husband, father, and grandfather, saying their hearts are broken. Brown was 87 years old. You know, he was an icon for a sport that was just starting to get a handle on the national spotlight rushing for more than 12,000 yards for the Cleveland Browns across eight seasons. He's an NFL champion, three-time MVP, Hall of Famer. Aaron Gilchrist is joining us now. He really was, like, the first big football superstar in this country before, like, we had Super Bowl fever and people knew sort of what, what the NFL was ultimately going to become. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Went to the Cleveland Browns in 1957 and, as you said, was an instant superstar on the football field and across the NFL at the time and really uh, was a player who started right out of the gate building up the accolades. Uh, he was a three-time MVP, including during his rookie year with the Cleveland Browns. I think something that uh, he's still the only rookie player to, to have gotten that title. Uh, he went on to lead the, the Browns to a 1964 championship title. He had He set all sorts of records 
Williams as a running back, rushing yards, rushing touchdowns, and really was just an impressive player uh, as a receiver, a kick returner, an athlete's athlete. He played so many different sports during his college career at Syracuse. Uh, it was in 1966 when he decided, though, after just a, a few seasons, fewer than 10 years playing pro football, that he was going to retire from the NFL and pursue an acting career. He was actually shooting a movie. He was in London shooting The Dirty Dozen when he made that decision that he wasn't going to come back and continue playing football and went on to have Halley uh, a long acting career as well in some 30 movies and TV show appearances as well. Uh, the, the Cleveland Browns and Syracuse both putting out statements today saying that uh, you know he was a legend in, in his own right in so many ways. He was a legend in his own right in so many ways and like emphasis on the latter part of that phrase, Aaron, in so many ways. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, in the, we're talking the Vietnam War era. He was bringing together sort of um, leaders of the time to, to protest. There was, there was a lot to him. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There was. Uh, he was a civil rights activist in so many ways. While uh, while he was acting, he still led other black athletes to to talk about some of the big issues of the day. There was a point where he organized what they called the Cleveland Summit. He got other professional black athletes at the time, Bill Russell, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, as we know him now, to go and talk to Muhammad Ali about his refusal to go into the draft to, to fight in the Vietnam War. Uh, and ultimately, they chose to stand with Ali at that time. In, in, in refusing to do so. It really was a watershed moment for black athletes and these social issues at that time for them to join together. You see that photo there with so many of the big athletes of that time. Uh, but, but Jim Brown went on to do other things. He supported black businesses with some of the organizations that he founded. Uh, he wanted to help young people as well. He worked to stop gang violence in communities uh, where he was seeing that happen and, and tried to redirect young people into more positive act, uh, activities. And, and so uh, this was a man who well into his, his later years in life was really having an impact uh, not just on sports history but on the world around him. Hallie? Aaron Gilchrist, thank you so much for that remembrance. Appreciate it. Still ahead, a big settlement tied to all those Hyundai and Kia car thefts, what it means for maybe millions of people, maybe even you. Plus, the huge strike averted, why it may be good news for people planning a trip this summer. Stay with us. How hard can it be to find a seven foot tall basketball star? Apparently, pretty hard for some lawyers. We're gonna explain in our five things. But first, today the US is sending help to Canada as smoke from some huge wildfires there is moving into parts of this country. Check out this video from today. This is one of those fires, just one of them in Alberta. I mean, look at it. You can see how big it is. You can see how hot it's burning. That's the area that's getting hit the hardest. So the firefighters trying to contain everything that you see. You see them. I mean, that's even a, a bigger shot of it. The planes flying through the sky. Thousands of people have been forced out of their homes. And it's not like relief is in sight anytime soon. These things are expected to burn throughout the weekend. And look at this map. Smoke is coming across the border, affecting air quality in the states that you see here down to Colorado. Look at North Dakota. I want to show you this. That is what the, that's just when you walk outside what it looks like. I mean, think about that in terms of air quality, right? It's obviously why officials say it is at unhealthy levels in parts of that state right now. Canada has more than 200 active wildfires burning. 81 of them, the ones in red, are still out of control. George Solis is joining us now. Um, this is an early wildfire season for Western Canada. It is an intense wildfire season for Western Canada, right? Yeah, that's right, Hallie. When you look at those images, one word really comes to mind, apocalyptic. And this is the landscape that has been created out there by some of this heat, this rampant heat that is starting earlier and earlier. So what's causing it, it really depends on who you ask. But many scientists will give you the consensus here and say, this is climate change in action. It is getting hotter earlier. Things are getting drier. So naturally, you have a lot more wildfires. Now, is it as severe of a heat as we saw a few years back with that deadly 2021 heat wave in the Pacific Northwest, which claimed a lot of lives. Well, again, that remains to be seen. One report from our own reporting here mentions research by a scientist, Nathan Gillette, who says he contributed to research and what's happening this month is an extreme event, he says, but it's less so in comparison to 2021. Of course, when you look at some of these images, many people will obviously disagree, especially when you're talking about air quality, right? I mean, not only is Western Canada being blanketed by this smoke, it is now obviously moving into the Midwest. It is moving into the Rockies. And a lot of this is obviously a danger to health. So the messaging from officials right now is if you don't have to go out this weekend, stay in and strap in because we could be in 
for a long haul, Hallie. There's also a business impact on this. I mean, there's clearly the impact on, first and foremost, the people who live in the region in Canada where these wildfires are happening in Western Canada, the firefighters, the people in the United States who are affected by the smoke of it, all, the smoke and the, the sort of air quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At, but then it keeps going, right? The list gets even longer. Yeah, the other side of this, of course, the economic <laughs> side. I mean, you have... Uh, some refineries out there who have stopped production out of an abundance of caution and how could you blame them right with these fires that are raging out of control so there could be some impacts to pain at the pump right you have 240,000 240,000 barrels of oil that can't be pumped each day in one section and you have another 2.7 million barrels of oil that are being stopped because they're burning in very high or extreme wildfire danger zones so again, the only real silver lining to some of this right now, Hallie, is these Canadian officials are saying there have been no injuries. But with this continuing through the weekend, if not longer, again, officials are warning that this could get worse before it gets better. Hallie. George Solis, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Hyundai and Kia have agreed to pay $200 million to settle a class action lawsuit over a whole bunch of car thefts. You had thieves exploiting a weakness in the software of these cars to easily start them and then disable anti-theft measures. The automakers are rolling out a software update to address this. They're also paying for steering wheel locks for people who can't upgrade. Number two, a DC police officer has been arrested for leaking confidential info to the leader of the Proud Boys. Lieutenant Shane Lamont is accused of warning the Proud Boys leader that there was a warrant for his arrest and then lying to federal investigators when they questioned him. He's been charged with a count of obstruction of justice and three counts of making false statements. Number three, American Airlines has gotten to a tentative deal with its pilots for a new contract, meaning the Potential for a strike seems to be averted, at least for now, perhaps. It's with tense negotiations happening all across the avi aviation industry. Pilots want more money. They want a better quality of life. There's been a pilot shortage ever since the pandemic, but new contracts on pause for four years. Number four tonight, the opening night of the WNBA season. It is a big one because Brittany Griner is set to get back on the court with the Phoenix Mercury facing off against the Sparks in L.A. It's going to be the first regular season game Griner has played since she was arrested and imprisoned in Russia last year. Number five, lawyers are apparently having a tough time getting a hold of a seven-foot-one superstar basketball player, Shaquille O'Neal. They want to serve him a lawsuit brought by FTX investors. Shaq's one of a bunch of celebrities who showed up in ads for the now-collapsed, now-failed crypto exchange. But somehow... Despite his height and massive fame and the TV show he's regularly on, Shaq has evaded them for months. The Wall Street Journal reports they even tried throwing the stack of legal papers at his car. But Shaq's team was like, that doesn't count. You can't just throw it at his car. We'll see. Will Shaq get served? TBD. Up next, foreign businesses are under more and more scrutiny in China. We'll talk about how the government there is defending a whole bunch of raids. Plus, a big effort to try to get relief to parts of Italy devastated by flooding. That's in the global. The series of raids on big international consulting firms in Beijing seems to have a lot of U.S. CEOs on edge, saying they want to bring their business to China, but they're afraid to do that. Just last week, the consultant's CapVision became the latest U.S. company to be raided by Chinese official in what's been described as a crackdown on foreign businesses. This is after raids at some other American-based firms, including Mintz Group, an investigative firm, and top management consulting firm Bain & Company. Bain, you know Bain. Chinese state media says the raids have been done in the interest of national security, claiming that some Western countries have been stealing intel about China's military and its economy. Janice Mackey Freyer is joining us now. There are so many pieces of this here that's like an onion, right? Layers and layers and layers. There's already kind of a bit of a, um, uh, I, I, I think fair to say, sensitive diplomatic dance being done as it relates to the U.S.-China relationship here. What are you hearing when it comes to businesses in China? American businesses trying to operate there with this latest sort of round of what seems to be crackdowns. Well, businesses are definitely on edge with this. Uh, the CEOs of the business leaders here that I've spoken to have said that China has traditionally been a place where there has been rules, clarity, transparency, and that has encouraged FDI in the past. And with these raids, that has gone away. And with that, uh, any confidence uh, that businesses have in the current environment here. Uh, 
uh, what happened with this latest raid is we saw Chinese security agents swoop down on several offices of Capvision. This is a business consultancy. They deal in economic data for mergers, for acquisitions. But this is now information that Chinese authorities have now deemed potentially sensitive with national security considerations. What it's done is that it's moved the goalposts for American companies, but they're not sure where those goalposts have been moved to. Uh, I spoke with Michael Hart. He is the president of AmCham China. That's the American Chamber of Commerce here about the impact. What we understand is the companies that have been targeted were those that were doing due diligence for potential mergers and acquisitions or collecting data for companies trying to understand um, you know, the economics around their business. So if, again, if you can't collect information, how can you run and manage a business? How can you plan future investment if you can't do due diligence on your future partners? Now, I was also told that they recently did a visit to Washington, D.C. They met with policymakers, they met with CEOs, and they said they were told at least a dozen times by CEOs that they want to come to China, they want to check in with their business in China, they want to continue to invest in China, but right now, they're afraid to come to China, Hallie. So we're going to see this chill take effect at a time when U.S.-China relations are also not in their best spot. The rationale is also kind of interesting here, right? Because Chinese officials, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but Chinese officials are basically saying, hey, like, this is a national security thing. We believe that some of these Western companies might be stealing, you know, stealing things they shouldn't as it relates to Intel, for example, about companies, even though China has been accused of doing the same thing in other nations, right? Well, and also at a time when China is trying to bolster its economy, it's trying to lure business back after three years of uh, COVID restrictions that kept most uh, companies out, uh, and at a time when there are other sensitivities in a very restrictive security environment with exit bans, with uh, some visa restrictions. So all of this now feeding into an environment where U.S. U.S. Uh, companies are beginning to lose confidence and trust in the Chinese system. Janice Mackey Freyer, live for us from Beijing. Janice, it's a fascinating look uh, behind the curtain there. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here is some of what they're watching in a new segment we call The Global. In the Pacific, a 7.7 magnitude earthquake in the middle of the ocean created a small tsunami that hit several South Pacific islands. Luckily, no damage was reported and the threat passed fast. Waves between eight inches and two feet above tides were reported across the region and locals were warned to expect strong and unusual currents. Out of Colombia, a desperate search is happening now for four children believed to have survived a plane crash in the jungle more than two weeks ago. The bodies of three adult passengers were recovered, but the four kids, ranging in age from 11 months to 13 years old, are still missing. Rescuers found some discarded items, some things thrown away, some improvised shelters they think the kids may have used to survive. And in Italy, the F1 League announced it's donating a million euros to support towns devastated by this week's flooding. F1's F1 had to cancel one of its Grand Prix this weekend after the torrential rains created a ton of flash flooding in the area. 14 people have died so far, with 15,000 forced to evacuate. Still ahead here on the show, how one baseball player's mental health journey is inspiring others. We're taking a look in tonight's original coming up. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we're talking baseball. Now, when you hear about your favorite players going on the injured list, you're probably thinking, okay, pulled a hammy, tore an ACL, like some kind of a physical thing that pains them. But nearly a third of the way into the season, three players have spent time on the injured list to treat their mental health. One of them, Colorado pick Rockies pitcher Daniel Bard, is opening up with her own Jesse Kirsch on why he needed to step away from the game. When you can throw a baseball close to 100 miles per hour, there's no question you're already a game changer. But this spring, Colorado Rockies star pitcher Daniel Bard changed the game in another way without throwing a single pitch. Normally, I thrive under that pressure. When I started to feel like I was getting this, that, those same emotions, but they were becoming negative, they weren't helping me, they were hurting me, I knew something wasn't right. Bard was battling anxiety ahead of opening day. He could have tried pushing through it, 
But instead, the 37-year-old reliever did something rarely seen in professional sports. He shared his struggle publicly, starting the season on the injured list to focus on his mental health. The Rockies say he missed 18 games before returning last month. It was just the anticipation of having to perform every day and not feeling confident in, in my ability to do that thing. Bard's one of three MLB players to openly take time off for their mental health this season. But that may be a serious undercount. Teams will never admit it, but they come up with fake injuries all the time for players when they need a break. Sports writer Danielle Allen Tuck says that can be for multiple issues, including mental health. There are probably a lot more of them out there. I think there's probably, you know, dozens, you know, three to four on every team every season. So why did Bard speak up? He says it took some pressure off, looped in his teammates and fans and helped him set an example for his kids. Whether it's mental health or otherwise, just letting them know that you can you can face hard things, you know, whatever that is. So hopefully they'll speak up. Hope so, or just, you know, use it in their life to, to, get, to get through something. After life's latest curveball, Bard's now back on the mound for the Rockies, an organization he says has been supportive. Clubs are hearing and, and listening to what's happening with their players. No doubt about that. And they're hiring psychologists, mental skill coaches, people who are trained to help players in this regard. The stigma has dropped. And so we are seeing more and more people saying, you know what, why wouldn't I work on this? In a statement, Major League Baseball telling NBC, we've been proud of our longstanding work in this space to provide players with support. MLB says it also just launched a new youth-focused mental health and wellness program. When things are good, you kind of walk out and you have this thought of, this is what I was born to do. I'm one of the best in the world. Let's go do this. Bard's journey resonating with some fans. I think it's a sense of an incredible message for those that also need help. And, you know, and so it's like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. If somebody has a tweak to hamstring, you're not going to ask him to go sprint on it every day to see if it gets better. If you view mental health kind of the same way, especially in sports, but really in, in, in any area, I think you'll see a lot of these issues that deal with it and get back to being being yourself. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now live. It is so fascinating to hear Daniel Bard talk about this, right? And I think it's important for people to know, it's not like he's a rookie. He's been in the majors for 15 years. It's also not his first sort of struggle with anxiety. He's been through something like this before. I wonder how it's different now for him than it was maybe a decade ago, right, when it comes to the mental health journey and being open about it. Yeah, and people should really look into his story because he has this incredible comeback story, Howie. Uh, bottom line is from uh, somewhere in 2013 until 2020, he was not playing Major League Baseball. He took all that time off. He was trying to stay in the majors, but he was dealing with something called the yips where he was having trouble uh, even having a simple game of catch. And obviously, as a pitcher, when you were trying to hit a very precise target, that's not going to work. So he was able to get back to the majors. And I asked him, looking back on that time when he was struggling with the yips, was he also dealing with anxiety then? And he says yes. And I asked him what he wishes he could say to himself from back then from about a decade ago and he says he wishes that someone was there to tell him that it's okay to take the time off talk to the right people and get the help you need he says he got pretty good at toughing it out and wasn't really addressing the anxiety which was part of he says the challenges he was facing all those years ago and obviously now he took that time and he's back to throwing on the mound Hallie great reporting Jesse Kirsch thank you so much for bringing us tonight's original really appreciate it it's, we've talked a lot about like AI and very a variety of contexts here on this show. Like I think about it in the terms of politics. I live in DC. We've talked about it in terms of what it means for, you know, technology, obviously. With movies, you know, even Harrison Ford himself said in, a, in an interview with the magazine Empire, it's a little spooky. I don't think I even want to know how it works, but it works. How does it work, right? Like, how is it being perceived and received in Hollywood? Well, with a little bit of trepidation yeah, uh, on multiple mm. levels. I mean, for actors, obviously, on the one hand, you could say, hey, isn't this great? I, they don't need to cast a younger version of me to do this movie. Uh, but the truth is, it may work when you look at someone's face and they've been sort of de-aged, but physically, they often still move at what their actual age is. And there's also just issues of protecting your image. So uh, Screen Actors Guild contracts are coming up soon. They're very interested in having real strong uh, rules in there about how AI is used to protect an actor's likeness. So there is a lot of concern about this technology also for scripts, for, for actors, for everything.
Joe, uh, it is fascinating. We'll see how it plays out. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour and for the one before it. And if you missed any of it, do catch up on the latest reporting and newest interviews from our team. You can find us anytime in so many places, including, as you see, Peacock, Hulu, YouTube. Just search Hallie Jackson now. It is good to be back with you. I am on assignment in Monday, but I'll see you from L.A. next week. We'll be debuting our guest L.A. studio, if you will, right here on NBC News Now. Top Story picks up our coverage now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.